young people are meeting bands, mm. like 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, they've got the knowledge. They yeah. know all about the studio and the mixing desk. They yeah. know all about the process. You know, what speakers are you using? Oh, I've got a pair of them. They know all about the video, mm. the business, the mm. publishing, the iTunes, what cut they're getting. Yeah. You know, and they've done an engineering course at college, you know, and that kind of thing. Whereas what they should, well, I think what they should do is focus on one thing. Yeah. You know, if they're a great guitarist, then be a great guitarist. Mm. What is really lacking in music today is virtuosity. There's very few yeah. really virtuoso musicians, singers, and writers because their heads are in so many other pockets that they've got to mm. pick up on, you know? But I suppose it, when you started, being a, you're a couple of years older than me, I suppose home studios weren't such a... I mean, they weren't no, really they a big weren't. thing in mind, but they, they at least had invented the portal studio, I think, when I started, so... Yeah. Well, there used to be this thing called semi-pro equipment, yeah. you know, which was... Revoxes. Like Fostex, Re... Well, not even... Yeah, I suppose Revox compared to Studer was, mm. was semi-pro. And... Um, it wasn't, you know, it was like second division kind of equipment, yeah. you know, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, Fostex and Tascam, TIAC and that kind yeah. of thing. And so it was never used in the studio. And my training from when I started and when I, you know, um, worked in the studios, it was always proper equipment. Yeah. Big desks. Yeah. You know, that's, that's why I was attracted to the job. Because yes. There used to be this thing about uh, people used to say, oh, a studio is, you know, it's like a spaceship or mm. something. And I thought work, being in the control room was was a bit like uh, my closest I'll ever get to go fly in a spaceship yeah. was to drive the desk, <laughs> you know. Um, so I suppose there wasn't that ambition there to have your own studio, was there? It wasn't the sort of... No. It was more that you get to play with all these big toys and... Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, to have the sort of... The, to have my own studio that I would want that'd be up to my standard would probably cost a million quid or more, yeah. you know, because I just never made that kind of money no. to... to branch out and, and look towards that it was never an ambition really to right. make my own studio yeah. I just really love going to other studios I yeah. love going to a studio I haven't uh, I haven't been to before I used to pride myself and I can probably do it now really but I mean days of tape and stuff but I used to pride myself that I could walk into any studio in the world and within 10-15 minutes start work mm. you know like quick rundown on the desk yeah. check out the monitors yeah off we go. I saw you iron everything up when you came in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Carry but on. it used to be funny, in, you yeah. know, in the in the old days because you have all the desks were a bit different. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Lots of custom and things. Had to root things and this kind of stuff. Mm. You know, you might have a MCI tape machine which you never used before or something. Right. So um, yeah, so I was always uh, I was always keen on exploring other studios, but yeah. I didn't really want one myself. You know. No, <laughs> well, I made the mistake. I went, I went and bought, put, well, I bought a second-hand porter studio after I'd been working in the studio yeah. for a, well, Livingston for a couple of years. I couldn't work out. I used the bloody thing. It was nothing <laughs> like working in a SSL at all. Yeah. <laughs> it completely confused me. But it's, I, I'm not a musician, you see. I was right. never, I was never a musician. In fact, I was talking to someone the other day because I never. It's funny because I never actually met a musician till I worked at Abbey Road right. can you believe that yeah. <laughs> like none of my mates I used to go to gigs two or three times a week I saw right. all the bands like Jimi Hendrix uh, The Nice John Mowry Eric Claps and all the bands from in the 60s went Stones in the Park and all this stuff mm. but none of my mates were, were musicians Right. and it wasn't until I got the job at Abbey Road where I actually stood next to someone playing the guitar mm. or a drummer you know like actually stood next to a drummer and found, mm. found out you know so um that probably is why i never yeah. got into gear because i never um i never want i never had any need to record myself you know no but you're always obviously keen on gear obviously the the, sort yeah. of the spaceship aspect of it yeah. but then it's obviously at some point you started producing and employing other people to press the buttons for you was uh did you sort of lose interest in the gear a bit at that point and focus more on the music or have you have you still always had that interest in the gear oh I've still had interest in the gear right yeah. so you yeah. still sort of check yeah. out yeah. what well, we were talking about plugins and things well, it, took me a, so. it took me a long time to 
work with engineers to sort of trust engineers. Yeah, you know, no, you no, work yeah, with yeah. me, sort of thing. But I always said, <laughs> <laughs> we don't want everyone to trust me. <laughs> but you know, it's like when you when you make that transition from being an engineer into a producer, mm. it's often very difficult mm. to trust someone to run the desk. Absolutely, you know? I don't even trust assistants to do anything. You even know, the most yeah. elementary things, you know, yeah. let alone EQ, but just routing and that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. like when you're setting up a band and you're routing all the tracks and things, mm. you end up double doubled, even though someone else is doing it, you're double checking mm. everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, just by visually, oh, has he got that right? And mm. if you find something wrong, yeah. you know, it's, you immediately like freak out. Oh no, you haven't rooted the hi hat yeah. or something. You know, <laughs> you're recording the bass drum and the snare drum on the same track. Yeah, you those, pillock. <laughs> those kind of things. But um, it, it is a difficult. I found it quite difficult. It took me quite a few years to find someone I could trust to to, to work with me, and uh, and then again going into a new studio mm. and trusting the staff to get on with it. All. Yeah. You know, and now I realise that that's the that's a great thing because yeah. if you've got like uh, staff engineers and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, staff engineers know the know the room, know the studio, work there every day, mm. and so you should really you know trust what they're doing and what their ears are and yeah. the way they do things. You know? well, there aren't so many staff engineers, are there? Really? Are they? Well, I suppose no. it's kind of come back a bit, and a lot of people have their own studio now, mm. don't they? And sort of, like me, I just work here all the time, so I, the monitors sound weird to anybody yeah. else except me. Yeah. But, uh, there was a time when everyone was freelancing everywhere and nobody knew anything. Nobody knew anything. a freelance assistant who didn't know where the kettle was. Well, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I was going to ask you then, do, uh, do you make any money out of Spotify or iTunes or anything these days? Is that... I don't think so, no. no. I've never seen about it. it. Well, I don't know, does anyone make any money out of Spotify? I've never... I mean, I, you get royalties on digital downloads but I've never sussed out how it's um, broken down what's iTunes and what's not but of course compared to the record company site or the you know the download from the record company site or the band site iTunes is immediately cut in half isn't it mm. iTunes takes half before you at start at least I think more than that isn't it Don't they? I well, don't, Tom Robinson was quite he said because uh, he gave away one of his records for free because he said you know mm. he gets 5p per Track out of iTunes and mm. Apple. The record label take fifty p and mm. Apple take twenty p. Or something. Mm. So you know, fuck that. I'm gonna just give it away for free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why bother? Yeah. But, uh, so what? So what's the future for producers? Any money then? <laughs> if everyone just has Spotify. I don't know to tell you the truth. Well, I mean, how do you take how... a big fee up front? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's always a good one. Yeah. You know. I mean, how, how pessimistic are you about? It? I mean, because obviously these. You know, Things do sell copies, don't they? People go and buy Stone Roses box sets, and well, that's right. Yeah, I think I think if you have a a good product, you know, if the record's really good mm. and it's marketed and presented really good, people will want it. Yeah, you know, um, you know, even silly little things like the cover. You know, mm. if you have if you have a great cover, like what was the cover I saw that that guy Mika. So you say his name, Mika or Mika? Mika, yeah. <laughs> Full Mika. <laughs> Mika. Um, his cover was great because yeah. it was really, you know, it was a really good thing. And right. I mean, I, you know, I don't not really into his music, but it was the sort of thing where I would have bought it just mm. for the cover, which I used to do in the past. You know, yeah. I mean, with vinyl, I'd often buy records just because of the look of the cover. Yeah, know, me too. Yeah. Without, you know, the, the, even hearing the music. Well, I think yeah, I saw you've been doing um, the Portico Quartet. The Portico Quartet. It was another. I saw some pictures of you at. Uh, was it Abbey Road? No, it was at Abbey yeah, Road. Yeah, you did Abbey yes. Road, didn't you? In Studio yeah. Two. In Studio With loads Two. Loads of mics and screens Fantastic. and things going on. Look great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, Portico Quartet assigned to Real World, and uh, they were nominated for the uh, Mercury. Mercury Music Prize last year. And I actually bought the record because I heard it and thought, wow, this is interesting. Mm. And then when I went up to Real World, Amanda there at the record company said, oh, we just signed Portico Quartet. And I said, wow, I've just bought the record, they're great. And so I met up with them and stuff. And um, knowing what they do, they're, they're, they're jazz, really. Mm. It's kind of string yeah, bass. I heard a bit on their MySpace, yeah. Um, drum, <clears throat> saxophone. And they play an instrument called the hang, which is like a, a, a tune, it's like a Jamaican steel drum, steel drum mm. but it's like a upturned 
wok kind of right. thing. It looks a bit like a flying saucer, actually. And he plays three of them. So he he makes uh, the pattern, or whatever you call it, the sequence. He plays the chords, kind of the yeah. rhythmic chords on these. Right. And the sax player jams over the top. It's not jamming, actually, because it's all tightly arranged. You yes. Know? Um, but it's improvised solos, I suppose. To a yeah, extent. yeah. Every take is different, yeah. and it depends on rise and fall and dynamics, yeah. crescendos, and that kind of thing. The drummer never plays where you expect him to play. <laughs> He's always on some strange. So it's beat. all instrumental, is it? Or all instrumental, no singing. Yeah. So what's your input in terms of like, musical arrangements and things? Are you kind of choosing the best takes or telling them which one you thought was? Yeah. All yeah. that sort of stuff. We spent about 10 days rehearsing. Yeah. Uh, they, they had a place up in Hackney. They all lived together in a big house, mm. you know. And uh, so we spent about 10 days going through the pieces. Mm. Of course, most of the pieces are bloody 20 minutes long. Yeah. You know? So did you say, and, uh, uh, do a, cutting the couple of bars yeah, out of the middle uh, eight? Well, hang on a minute. I just timed <laughs> this, you know, and they don't know, you know. No. They just play. And I'm timing it, and it's like it's 18 minutes long. Right. Like, you've got to... You've got to lose two thirds of it. Oh, we can't do that. I go, well, okay, you've got an album with two tracks on it. <laughs> I mean, well, we want to put 10 tracks on the album. <laughs> so I said, well, the first thing, we, so you spend 10 days choosing the best bits, working right. out, and then, you know. Just, so it's like editing before you'd recorded it? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot cheaper that way. Yeah. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> So yeah, you just get into the music and you sort of relate to them and tell them what's good, you know, what's yeah. good, what's a lot of faffing around. Hmm. Like a lot of their music would start with, uh, well, in, in Indian classical music, it's called an alap, which is the start with no rhythm. Mm -hmm. So as the piece starts, it might just start with the hang setting up a pattern and a sort of drone on the sax before the drums or anything comes in. Mm -hmm. And then when they're sort of established, the rhythm will come in, right. which is kind of how Indian music works. Right. And um, very often this will go on for like 10 minutes mm. before the drums come in. And I'd go, whoa, whoa, hang on. <laughs> I'd say, well, let's have the drums in after eight bars, yeah. you know, or something, you know. And is that how they, th do they think in eight bar sections or? Uh, yeah, they do count, they do yeah. count, count bars, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what my job was, really, yeah. to keep them all enthusiastic, stop any fighting going on and <laughs> fear some sort of battles between them. But they were, yeah. they were fine. Did you get a lot of exercise up and down the stairs in the studio too? I did, yeah. I'm used to that. I can do that myself. <laughs> but no, I, it was great because I think I got the job because I suggested four days in Abbey Road. Yeah. And they all sort of sat up and said, hey, that's a good idea. You know, it's like rather than go to a cheaper studio and spend four weeks. Yeah. Um, and then we went to the big room at Real World and mixed it. All oh, right. Which uh, wasn't the most easiest thing to do with mixing the big room because. Um, Was that just because they're signed to Real World Records and you got a yeah, bit of a deal? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They like to keep a, something in house, mm. you know. Um, but the big room, of course, is big. Enormous, yeah. And you actually, once you get used to it, you. You get, you know, you get quite a good result because yeah. you know, you've got the SSL and you've got all the gear and stuff. The main thing is you're monitoring and what speaker you're listening to, <laughs> whether you're listening to the left hand speaker or the right hand speaker. You've got to keep central and keep equidistance and all this kind of yeah. thing. And usually monitor quite loud in there because you need yeah. to fill the room really. Yeah, it's a lot of air to move, isn't it? Mm. Mm. So I suppose you can get used to anything though, can't you really? It's you do well. I think that's that's true with monitoring. Yeah, um, I've managed to get used to this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I've always been, I've always no, disagree. Is that the word? <laughs> disagree with acoustic treatment. Yeah, you know, like all this scientific acoustic oh, no. treatment well, very just, often doesn't see, work. I haven't, I haven't bothered. <laughs> and what it's really down to is the individual that's running the desk that's mm. checking the monitors and knowing, knowing what. What records are what, like. what records are like, and where how how a quality recording responds on the monitors. Yeah, you know, I mean, Abbey Road Two, when they did Dark Side of the Moon, was a, uh, was a pair of JBLs up on the on, the, and there was absolutely no bass. You couldn't hear any bass unless you sat in the corner yeah. up against, put your head against the wall. It's the only way you could <laughs> hear bass, and uh, yet. Yeah, 
Dark Side of the Moon is totally all right, yeah. recorded and mixed in yeah. that room. Mm -hmm. And it's just that Alan, Alan Parsons knew the room mm -hmm. and you knew, you know, what the response of it was, you know, right. how, where to go with it and what mm -hmm. the balance and everything is. Yeah. And um, I think it kind of comes from experience, you know, mm -hmm. You know, checking it with CDs. Obviously, yeah. you're going to make mistakes and things, and um, you just have to kind of be sensible with mm. it. Really. Well, I mean, it's amazing how many naming no names. We, we've interviewed a few producers who've got their own rooms, and some of the acoustics in some of these places, you think, bloody hell, it's mm. <laughs> terrible. But they, you know, these people get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got that terrible attic at the side, hasn't he? Um, yeah. yeah, it's a mad place, you know. For the, but I, mean, when I, I do this prefer card, this feels good it feels kind well, exactly. of neutral I mean, it's just really. come it's from, not too live not too well, exactly it's just come from my experience of being in lots of crap studios and lots of good studios and you kind yeah. of throw enough carpets in just to make it yeah work, and that's right and, it's, it's, and you need a balanced thing and it seems to have that really it's alright yeah. yeah it's and comfortable and the best thing in studio designs is velvet curtains yeah because velvet curtains you can close, you've got the folds, you know, they're going yeah. to absorb it, or you can and open the, it. And the bare breeze blocks behind, I'm told, are better than painted breeze blocks in that they ex they absorb lower frequencies. Right, I think yeah. I read that in a book somebody lent yeah, me. Yeah, because the air goes through. Yeah, yeah they got the holes. So they, yeah, because yeah. paint actually does quite a, quite a yeah, difference. Yeah, so I left the breeze blocks bare, and mm. Fiona found these in a local shop, the suede curtains, and adapted That's them fun. to fit, and jobs are good, really. And... Uh, and the other thing, the best thing about being at home is I got the. Sorry, this is the George Schilling interview now. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Start interviewing. Well, I got I got a cable going through into the front room, so I can go and have a listen on my hi fi at each point, you know, which is kind of the only time you ever really know, isn't it, when you get it yeah. home? Mm. So uh, it picks up a bit of interference off the computer monitor cable, but it's kind of good enough to get a rough idea of how it's going to sound on your hi fi when you get home. That's great. Is that going? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, we have started. Yeah. <laughs> when are we going to do the interview? Yeah. Do you want any biscuits? We've, uh, there's uh, some uh, Tesco's finest, if you. Biscuits? No, no, no. no. <laughs> biscuits? After all that food. No, no. right. Just in case. Yeah. Um, what else have we got to talk about then? How much video you had? How long does that It's run? clever, isn't it, that? When you, um, when you first make contact with an artist, how do you approach it? If you've, if you've heard some ropey old demos, and you've decided it's somebody you want to work with. What what do you say to them? Do you tell them how great? Well, first thing is, most bands these days don't have ropey old demos. This is true <laughs> because it's, it's, hard, it's hard to best them sometimes. Isn't yes, it? That is, the frightening thing is most bands' demos are you know Pro Tools up. You know they're all yeah. polished, tuned, double tracked, yeah. mixed, perfect, and uh, it gets very difficult actually yeah. because you kind of think. Well, hang on. The first thing you put it on, and you think, "Whoa!" It jumps out, and you think, "Wow, this band's fantastic." Mm. And then you sort of listen again, and you kind of think, "Well, hang on. They've never made a record before. They've obviously got some whiz kid Pro yeah. Tools engineer guy mm. who's sampled all the drums and everything else, you know. Yeah. So you've got no idea what the drummer's like. You're starting from square one. Yeah. And the best way to see a band really is at a gig. Yeah. Or if you can't bear the gig, a rehearsal room really, yeah. and get to know what it's all about. You know, mm. the worst thing actually is nowadays is there aren't ropey old demos. No, know. it's always good point. totally yeah. polished up, and not really. A, a, it's not really a demo anymore. It's yeah. just you know, it's not an honest representation of where the band are at. Mm. So you have to be a bit cautious when you're listening to those demos. I think. So what do you say to them when you've heard their extremely polished? Drum replaced <laughs> Pro Tools and mastered to <laughs> an inch of its life. <laughs> you, 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 quite, you quite like the songs. You ring up and you go, Hello, it's John Leckie here. I really like your demos. Yeah. What do you, what do you say? <laughs> what do I say? Um, I don't know, really. I just, I just kind of say, um, Well, I'd rather do it in the rehearsal room, actually, yeah. and go, go and see them as they play together. Yeah. And what they want to do, what they're aiming to do, whether mm. they're aiming for it to sound them, realistically them, or whether they're aiming to, um, whether they're, you know, most bands want to make the best record ever, mm. you know, which nowadays often means sampling all the drums and doing all that kind of things. Depends on kind of how honest they are about yeah. themselves. Mm. And what the record company involvement is, you know, whether the record company is only interested in hits, mm. you know, if it's 
you know Sony or EMI all they want is the hit single yeah um and I'd I'd, I'd I'd rather work with artists that are sort of honest you know about yeah. their sound and their abilities and the songs and that mm. kind of thing is that why you've ended up probably in more recent years doing more world music -y kind of projects where it is more about just probably, yeah. capturing a performance yeah probably and is that sort of music you go out and buy and listen to and enjoy particularly or do you go um, out and buy I buy all sorts of things yeah. I don't really buy chart stuff you know, I don't no. buy like Britney Spears or the name Lady Gaga or something I mean I don't do that um, I don't know what music I buy actually it's always a funny question they go what you're listening to well, yeah how do, I mean, do you listen to six music or how do, you, how do you discover things or find things like that what are your sources? Do you poke around on the internet? And... Yeah, I poke around on the internet more than yeah. anything. Um, recommendations from friends? Yeah, and magazines and recommendations right. from friends. And Mojo and... Mojo, Word, Q, Guardian, so you... Sunday Times. So you, 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 read, a lot of, you yeah. read a lot of reviews then? Yeah, and if I like, if something attracts me, I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll actually go and buy it. You know, I will buy it. On the basis of a review? Yeah, yeah. and I probably buy... What do I buy? Probably 10, 10 12 CDs a, a month or something. I just go have a splurt on Amazon and yeah. tick everything off and stuff. Do you keep everything or do you listen to them once and go, that was rubbish, and put it, throw it back at the <laughs> tape exchange hand, or whatever yeah. you do these days? Um, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> no, no, usually I keep it because very often you can rediscover things. Yeah. That was an interesting thing actually about downloads and stuff right. is that when you got vinyl or racks of CDs, you know, like I see, you know, you have, and you have a library of mu a library of music was mm. on there, and you can go back and rediscover the CD that you, you know, just threw on the shelf and didn't like, yeah. and then five or six years later, you can you can pick it off and see it. Whereas with all the download stuff, you'll delete it, yeah, and it'll be gone, yeah, you know. Um, and so yeah, you're at the, often when you've got your record collection, you know, not only can you share it with friends like you can go oh uh, you know that band the coral and go oh yeah i've got three of their records yeah you take one or something you know i often give cds to friends that come around so right. that they can discover it and that kind of thing but you know with internet and downloads and people just delete now and it's yeah. gone people don't really build up a, a library or a collection because there's that, that whole thing of your personality, who you are, is your record collection. I suppose that's mm. your iPod, really, isn't it? Yeah. But I don't know. I, I just, I'm I'm completely beflummoxed by digitals and iPods and this whole what Microwaves. you play music for. <laughs> you know, you got to remember that. Yeah. Well, you got to remember. <laughs> you got to remember that in the '60s or something, or in the '60s or '70s, there was your record collection. You know, and you listen. You may only have ten yeah. or twelve records. Yeah. But you listened to them and you shared them and that kind of thing. Um, and now you've got, you know, now you've got thirty thousand songs there. Mm. But the other thing is, is that you never heard music unless you went home and played it. Mm. You know, and it was, it was like a little sort of clique gang thing where mm. you would be into the blues or jazz or you'd be into African music. So all your mates would be into African music, and that's what you would do. Um, and now there's so much music everywhere every time you go shopping you know you mm. go around some shopping place and you know you want to buy a pair of shoes and you're just bombarded with music everywhere yeah. um, TV and stuff you know when MTV first came out you know everyone's wow look at that you know there's you know everyone's making little videos for their songs and it was great but now you know you've got on Sky there's like 30 music channels yeah. which you never watch mm. <laughs> So I think, you know, music's totally saturated our life, Yeah. you know, which kind of puts you off it, you know. Yeah, you, absolutely. Remember when you got your first car radio yeah. or your first cassette in the mm. car with a graphic, you know, yeah. I used to have this cassette with a graphic equaliser in the car and it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I used to play stuff in the car all the time. I never now just listen to Radio 4. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's an age thing. I think it's because you're kind of bombarded. It's probably is an age thing. No, right? well, I listen to Radio Four, and I'm mm. not. I'm not quite as old as you, so you know. <laughs> but, but it's true, yeah. I mean, well, I suppose it's partly also if you spent all day listening to music in the studio, the last thing you want to do driving home. Yeah, but I still but do. Then, I listen to music. Uh, I'm thinking about that. I did. Yeah, well, in the seventies, I, yeah. I 
be in the studio all day and still drive home and you're right actually listen to stuff so i'd give tony yeah. a lift home from livingston and we'd listen to cc sputnik the car, on the jesus mary on. chain at deafening volume on the way home yeah no you would you yeah. still listen to music yeah. in What's those there? it's because you weren't bombarded with it all yeah. the time and the other thing is that you're bombarded with maximized music yeah you know and that thing of uh, where it's always present loud. everything's loud every little detail is is pushed forward mm. so that you don't miss it you know mm. there's no sort of drop in it there's no what's the word Dimin dynamic diminuendo well, yeah. Yeah, no quite bits <laughs> no, italian word Diminu yes. diminuendo yeah, <laughs> pianissimo <laughs> classical trained <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, you're right. I, I joined Pipe Down, the campaign against Muzak, mm. along with Julian Lloyd Webber. But it's terrible if you Alfred go Rindle. if you go around the shopping place, yeah, you know, that's buy, disgusting. Some, buy some stuff. Marks or and Spencer's something. putting bloody music all the time. Yeah, yeah, and it's just. So I started. You know, they've started putting music on in hospitals now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's outrageous, really. You don't mm. want to be lying in your hospital bed listening. But that used to, like, in the sixties, having music played in a shop, pop yeah. music played yeah. in a shop, was really hip. Right. You know, you go in the boutique yeah. kind of thing, and then, oh man, they're playing, you know, the Rolling Stones in a shop. You know, and it was really kind of special, yeah. groovy. Whereas now it's just like you go in the garage and there's stuff blaring yeah. through. You know, it's mad. Stuff. You're very keen on sort of the origins of rock and roll, and I remember you buying Bo Diddley records when we were in oh, yeah. New York and things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're a big fan of early blues stuff, aren't you? Aren't Absolutely. You? You're yeah. very keen on the sort of heritage of rock yeah, and roll. Aren't yeah, yeah. Tell us about your. I mean, because you feel quite, you, well, you feel quite strongly, don't you, that that's part of the something we you should know about in yeah uh, as yeah. a as a practitioner of yeah making pop records yeah yeah yeah. Um, well, I suppose I I sort of I grew up with the blues, man. <laughs> when I was a when I was about thirteen, I think yeah. I got really into blues music. You know, yeah. I used to go to the record library and come out with Sleepy John Estes and you know Robert Johnson and that kind of thing and um that's how really how i first discovered music actually is from blues music you know mm. um and you know there was the the stones and i didn't really move away and john mail and eric clapton of course which was, was was the greatest thing um but i just i just find it fascinating like the the history of rock and roll the way it was uh it was a rebellious thing and it was an electric thing, like the electric guitar, mm. particularly like with Bo Diddley, he used to make his own guitar and make strange sounds out of it, you know, yeah. Link Ray and the the uh, tremolo arm, you know, the, the, that kind of stuff. Um, and it was all probably part of being in the spaceship and science fiction and hearing all these cosmic sounds and strange noises right. that would, you know, come out of a guitar. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question here because we're going it's from good, old though, blues yeah. to to other stuff. Well, that's all related, yeah. isn't it? It's all part of mm. yeah, in fascination with sound and so yeah, on. yeah. So that kind of explains. Well, when it. when I was to, to, when I was at college, I went to college and I did a thesis on electronic music. Wow! Um, and it was all handwritten, and it's, it's probably how I got the job at Abbey Road actually because right. I took this in and showed it to Ken Townsend. Yeah, and he sort of looked through. Oh, this is very good. This is very good. I've still got it. It's all handwritten. Wow! But it was about. Uh, it was just called uh, electronic music. I think it was called. But I went through the technical side, like oscillators and really? filters and that kind of thing. Wow! And there was no information on electronic music at the time. I used to go around record shops, copy, and I used to copy the back of Stockhausen records with <laughs> little pictures. Yeah. And I used to be in the record shop with a notebook, copying the back of any information on electronic music. And um, what I included in that was like Jimi Hendrix and Pink Floyd, right? You know the whole sort of guitar electronic music, which mm. was a new thing. You know, like That's distortion, same. echo, phasing, which was this mysterious sound that you didn't, you know, at the time I had no idea what it was. It was just like this amazing cosmic sound of you know whooshing and you know turning everything inside out. A lot of people don't. It's not used enough, actually. Yeah. Have a proper tape phase, yeah, like extreme yeah. phasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never hear modern records doing it no. like now, like Ichiku Park and stuff. You know. Um, so yeah, I did. I 
I'd always been into uh, crazy sounds, really. Yeah. It's probably because I'm not a musician, you see, mm. and that was a way I felt I could be a musician was by making all the all those sounds. Yeah. And, um, and then I was interested in blues music because I was hearing the same sounds happening, you know, right. like with Bo Diddley and distorted guitar, Howling Wolf would have Hubert Sumlin playing some crazy echo reverbed guitar sort of thing. And then even some of the old blues singers, like I used to get a compilation of uh, rural blue, you know, country blues people that was all recorded in 1926 or something. But each track sounded different. Mm. You know, like the ambience behind the voice and stuff or the sound of the guitar. Each one would would have a different sound, you know. Some of it would be really thick and mm. some of it you couldn't make out if it was two guitars playing. And, you know, so I was always, like, trying to get in there and sort of get in there and see the visual of the sound. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. It's like visually, like, see what it was, what I was hearing. So has the magic gone at all? Because it's so easy to dial up sounds and manipulate things in computers. Has it spoiled it for you? or um, uh, It's a lot... Uh, it, well, it's, it's a lot easier, but you still have to have the original inspiration, the idea yeah. for it. And it's not as exciting, really, because because of the you know it's the old thing of the limitations, really. Because you had you only you know you you just had four tracks or eight tracks mm. and a, a reverb spring and you know like the limitations of, for instance, phasing. You know mm. that's tape phasing came about because it because it happened you know it's very difficult to do it you know if, yeah. if you got the pro tools but you can't do it in this room <laughs> you could simulate it but it yeah. wouldn't be the way it's played because tape phasing is you know you play it with yeah, the with various the speed, speed knob. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i've done it yeah but not in there no. no i've got a plug-in <laughs> to do that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did you design real tape flange or whatever it's called is it really oh yeah it's pretty good you can go past the null point with it and everything. yeah but you see what you would do is that you if you did it you would think about it you see yeah whereas when you do it with proper tape it's a yeah. lot about going out of control with it yeah of course you yeah know? it's like being on on the edge i know yeah, oh, yeah. My, oh, it's much know, more fun yeah it's much more fun when it's out of control yeah. it's probably like playing guitar yeah you know when it's when it's really on the point of feedback and you can't quite control yeah. it yeah and it sounds really exciting, you know. And often I work with guitarists where you get that, and the first thing they do is turn it down. I go, no, no, don't turn it down. Like, <laughs> hold on to it, you know. It's like riding a horse, you know. Yeah. And I don't know, I'm not a guitarist, but, <laughs> you know, I often find with musicians, you know, their best moments are when yeah. it's really out of control and they can't quite hold it back, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And it's the same with, you know, mixing, manual mixing, before yeah. you had automation and all that stuff when you did a mix, it was a performance yeah. and you'd finish the mix and you'd be sweating and your heart would be going, oh, we got there, you know. And none of that's sort of there anymore. No. But then again, it could be. It's because it's only up to the operator to choose that. You know, you well, people are inherently lazy, aren't they? Mm. Sort of, you know, I mean, I've got all this gear in the rack, but I just do everything with, in the box. In the box. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, because yeah, people are used to you doing that, though, your clients will then ring you up two weeks later and go, the mix was perfect. I just want to, you know, you can't be, I can't yeah. be writing down all this stuff. You know, right, right, the recall. I've got time to do that. Yeah, yeah. The amount of money they're paying me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of all these um, music technology courses that people are doing? Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, i tell you what was interesting. I, I met a bloke yesterday, actually. Uh, Glenn, what's his name? Glenn Rowe was a tour manager. He's just started a school for roadies, right. <laughs> which is the best thing. School for roadies and tour managers is right. at Guildford, I think. Yeah. And he's got 28 students first term. And he's, you know, he said it's because he's been, you know, like a roadie for 25 years. Yeah. And, the, you know, he's saying that the future is in the live thing. You know, yeah. they will never be out of work if they yeah. want to do it. They yeah. will be out there, but they've got to learn how to do it. You know, we're not talking front of house mixing or something, you know, but it's the whole picture of being a tour manager, you know, yeah. guitar tech, roadie tech, taking the money, getting the band out of bed in the morning, 
uh, earth in, you know, that yeah. first aid, he does a first aid course, mm. everything that a rodeo or a tour manager will need to know, right. everything he's learned in his 25 years of experience, yeah. what Brilliant. you need to know. And it was great because I was with the, in this rehearsal room, right? And the singer was singing and the mic stand kept going down and he kept tightening it up and it wouldn't go up anymore. And he said, roadie school, marigold rubber gloves. <laughs> And that grips it, and that's what turns it up. You know, that you, you get a grip on something, yeah. and the first thing you need is washing up gloves, yeah. and you get an, an extra grip yeah. to do it. Little things like that, you know, and first aid, you know. Yeah. You know, the band's, band's just about to go on stage, and bang, the singer cuts his head or something. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> Well, that sounds like a good idea. But what about these music tech courses? <laughs> uh, send them all to roadie school. Yeah. Get more money. <laughs> there's a lot of people doing music technology, aren't there? There is, yeah. Hell of a lot. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I just no. don't. I don't know. Um, it's funny because um, band members, what do you call them? Pop stars, <laughs> rock stars, people in bands yeah. these days, they have to know everything. Mm. They have to write great songs, sing great songs, play great guitar, know all about their equipment, every single pedal and piece of equipment that's available, know how to work Pro Tools and all the gear and different types of mics to use. Mm. They have to know all about videos and how maybe even you know how to be how to look good in a video. They have to have a good script, be a good script writer. They have to be able to design their record cover more or less do it all themselves, or at least have a focused opinion about it, hmm. as well as having a great haircut and great clothes. But then I suppose the greatest stars always did have an overall, you know, when you think about Madonna or Bob Dylan or something like that, they I were suppose, always... Yeah, the big ones, yeah. They were always on the case of all that sort of stuff, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, But, yeah, I, know, I see what you mean. Yeah, the big stars. Hmm. But sometimes... Johnny Mitchell just... painted her own record sleeves and, you know... So, so did Bob Dylan and there you go. Madonna had all their concepts of her different images yeah. didn't she? and David Bowie mm. and then the you know business side no all I'm saying is that you know a lot of young people are meeting bands mm. like 20 year olds 25 year olds they've got the knowledge they yeah. know all about the studio and the mixing desk they yeah. know all about the process you know what speakers you're using oh I've got a pair of them they know all about the video mm. the business the mm. publishing the iTunes, what cut they're getting, yeah. you know, and they've done an engineering course at college, you know, and that kind of thing. Whereas what they should, well, I think what they should do is focus on one thing. Yeah. You know, if they're a great guitarist, then be a great guitarist. Mm. What is really lacking in music today is virtuosity. There's very few yeah. really virtuoso musicians, singers, and writers because their heads are in so many other pockets that they've got to mm. pick up on, you know? Um, you know, and in the old, in the old in the 60s or 70s, you know, all the, the singer had to do was look good and sing a great song, you mm. know? And well, sing. I don't think also there's a lot more, like, as you've discovered, press and interviews to do, because yeah. there used to be BBC and ITV. Exactly. And now there's... Yeah, now yeah. you've got to do all the magazines and everything, and and you know and, and write your next album <laughs> and everything else you know because you know in the 70s the sunday times wouldn't be that interested in pop music well exactly yeah but now every national newspaper every newspaper yeah you know. every local newspaper every radio you know there was only you, you wouldn't have got an interview on the radio unless you were top of the pops unless mm. you're in the top 10 yeah even then you wouldn't you know or mm. something Whereas now, you know, you only just you can be an amateur and still get an interview on the local radio and all sorts of yeah. stuff. So it's a really busy life, and you've yeah. got to cover all your bases. It doesn't actually make you a success. No. You know what makes you a success is being good at one thing, like virtuosity. You either have a great song well, or you've got a great. You song. get one or two virtuo virtuos virtuistic. <laughs> What's the word? <laughs> you get some very good people. Are you pop up on YouTube playing the guitar really well or something mm. and showing off and doing all this stuff? But <laughs> what you find though is that, in my experience, the, gen the general standard of band members isn't no. up to much. You know, no. you might get a great singer or something, but then the bass player's a bit out of time mm. and the drummer's got a pretty crappy snare drum or, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a mixture of sort of. Whereas there are a few really great 
strangely mm. talented prodigies. Um, but the sort of average level seems to have dropped a bit. Yeah. I think, you know, like great great pianists or Eric Clapton or, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. So, um, AKG D19C, classic Mike or a load of old rubbish? D19C. <laughs> um, <laughs> so classic Mike. Mike, yes. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Replaced by the D190, which is nothing like it. Yeah. Um, classic Mike depends on what you want to use it for, yeah. You can oh, because I have both. I have, well, it's not mine. Somebody's lent me a D19C and I have a D190 as well. Quite different, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. I haven't compared them yet. Not much top on them, but... No. D19, different. You've got a funny little DIN plug in the That's back. That's right, yeah. That's three a, pin a two-shell mm. adapter. Oh, right. Yeah, you get the three pins. I think it's cool. And they've got a lead with an excellent... Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I just wondered. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't use them. Actually. <laughs> no, I forget do. about it. I forget about it. Use a proper it. mic instead. I'd use yeah. a proper mic because yeah. they're because they're, they're they're the ones you see over Ringo's kit, aren't they? The that's because all that's all they had. Yeah, and it was the only one that they were allowed to put over the kit in case it got too loud. Yeah, you couldn't put an eighty-seven over it in case it blew the mic or something. <laughs> you know, which was nonsense. You know? <laughs> it's like Jeff Emmerich got a bollock in for putting the the D twenty too close to the bass drum you know right. someone saw him you know you can't put it there you've got to put it at least a foot back you know it'll blow the capsule which it didn't no know. <laughs> but presumably though just through that circumstance so that's that's partly the sound of the Beatles records the D19 it and is. the D20 too far away from the bass drum that's right so if you do that will you make it sound like the Beatles um no, because the drummer wouldn't play like Ringo, <laughs> and it well. wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be. But is that part of the same. magic? Is that part of the magic formula? Well, yeah, so, yeah, I'd say it so is. D nineteen. I'd say it is. Yeah, maybe I'll try that then. Yeah, but you know, need a drum. you'll regret it actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'll put an eighty-seven next to yeah, just in if case. You were, if you were, if you had a great band. And they yeah. said, oh, I want to sound like Ringo. And you go, oh, no problem. I'll put the D19 there and the D20 yeah. there. And that's all you need. And then he does his Tom fill. And he goes, I can't hear the floor, Tom. You go, well, we'll have to do another take then. Because put a mic on it. You know, you'd have to do another take. You could take. always hear Ringo's floor, Tom, though, couldn't you? I know. It's amazing. How does that work? Well, it's magic, isn't it? It's Norman <laughs> Smith. Lots of outtake compression going on or something. Outtake compression. Yeah, there's another thing. The outtake compressor, right, when I started Abbey Road, and in fact, they're modified. Um, they're not bog standard outtakes I don't know they're in the green yeah. green box with the sort of yeah. black and white thing mm. and basically all you had to do was make sure it was like halfway on the 10 like the needle was just hovering around halfway and that was alright but they used to record through it Yeah, record through it all the drums went through it and the bass you never put the vocal through it the vocal always went through the Fairchild but um, bass drums guitars would all go through the outtake when you mixed it, you put it all through the outtake again. And then when you took it up to the cutting room, it all went through the same outtake again, <laughs> just on the 10, just hovering yeah. like halfway. So yeah, that is the sound of it. That's what you need. But the, the Beatles mono reissues uh, are less limited than the, the stereo ones. They're, they're the original. Are they? Yeah. What, this new Beatles yeah. stuff? Are they remixes? No, they're just remasters. Really? I thought they mixed. I thought they no. got the multi tracks. No, I thought so, but no, they spent four years mastering it somehow. They, but they did it in America as well, didn't they? It's not mastered at Abbey Road. Yeah, Guy Massey and S- Steve. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. There's articles in all Sound on Sound this month all about it. Ah, I didn't know. You never leave everything you read, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they thought... copied all the, 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 the mixes into Pro Tools at 192 through some prisms or whatever, and they tittered about a and lot and did a bit of denoising on the fades with software stuff to get rid of uh-huh. the hiss um, they limited the stick because you know there's two so boxes. they never went back to multi-tracks yeah. oh, I thought they did no because they did I'll do that next time that already well they did it with, they did it for the anthology and didn't and they stuff. Yeah. yeah and they did it with All Things Must Pass and the Lennon and some Lennon yeah stuff. And, the, and the video anthology thing the DVDs oh look um, yeah Peter Cobbin remixed them in surround sound yeah they spent years doing that Okay. So the new stuff is the new stuff is just remasters, is it? Okay. And they've put the monos in a box. But how come set? the stereo? I thought the stuff. Someone says something that the stereo is great and it's not 
you know, it's not ping pong stereo. It's not like drums on one side and vocals on the other. Well, I know it still is. Um, is it? It's the same mixes, oh. although well, there were different mixes that George Martin did for the original CDs in the eighties. Oh right. He did some of them. He remixed then. Um, but no, they've what they've done is they've reissued the stereo ones, and you can buy them individually and in the box set. Mm. And they're they're limited by about four or five dBs to make them sound like a modern record. Oh right. Whereas the monos, they've left them as they were without any extra limiting. But they've denoised them, de-esed them. De-esed them. Yeah. Well, de-esed them. It's not vinyl. <laughs> de-esed no, them. Yeah, they, they, and they've ta- they've taken out some of the clicks and pops and things. Apparently, they've somehow. They're the best bits. <laughs> exactly. It's revisionist. I, I'm with you. Yeah, they've they've um, they've yeah they they're rewriting history basically. If if you do a record on tape, you know, for instance, like me. Me at my age, with my experience, if I go out saying, "Well, I'm only going to record on tape," I, pr- I probably wouldn't get any work. I, mean, what can I-, I probably wouldn't get any work. I probably wouldn't get. Any- you know, it, there's yeah. a danger of it being retro. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like you use the best equipment, like you use a Val 47, yeah. or the best equipment for the Sonics, you use a Studio tape machine. You mm. know, but it's considered retro, and you'll yeah. probably get. A retro result, you know, you'll get an old fashioned. You wouldn't get a sound that sounds contemporary with today, mm. you know. There's something about the sort of old recordings, though, that there's a bit of magic that even if you get all that gear in again, it's impossible to sort of recreate. Mm. Do you not find? Do you not think? Well, it's, it's because of what you're doing. There's yeah. musicians, isn't there? It's yeah. the music and the songs. Have you got the bootleg Beatles in? Yeah. You know, it's like the Ruttles, you know, the Ruttle, I know the Ruttles was years ago, but the Ruttles actually sounded like the Beatles, didn't they? Yeah. The drums and everything. Yeah. I'm sure if you got the bootleg I Beatles so, in, yeah. with all, in Abbey Road 2 with all the gear, yeah, it would sound like it, but it's a lot to do with musicians and, you know, what you're, what you're, what they're doing. I think people, because right? people that don't have, because if people know what you can do, mm. it changes their whole perception anyway. And yeah. And it's impossible to turn the clock back. Expectations of it, yeah. I mean, once I started using Pro Tools, it's you know it's hard to go back to. Me too. Yeah, I, tape. Don't, I couldn't even do. Well, the last tape thing I did was with you. Was in, it in, in the New America? York? Yeah, it was the <laughs> last thing I did on tape. I think. Was it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And we did we put it on Pro Tools. Yeah. No, it was mixed on tape. I think we got yeah. the tape out. Yeah. Well, we end. did have a Pro Tools, and we put one or two tracks, but yeah. we were fairly disciplined. It's great. Well, I after that I did my morning jacket. I remember. Which yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, at uh, uh, on sixteen track. Yeah, well, we and were on again, sixteen track. Yeah. We were on sixteen. But well, we don't remember. We we turned up the first day. We were just going, let's do it on sixteen track. That's and right. then we said, well, are we gaining much? Let's put, let's go twenty four track. We could really do the extra eight tracks. And we put it up, and it didn't sound as good. And we that's got the right. bloke to put it the third day. We got him to put it back to sixteen track that's again true. and carried yeah, on. True. And there was one song on twenty four track, and the rest of the album on that's sixteen right. track. You're absolutely. That was a great exercise. It was, actually, wasn't it? it was to really be good. able to put a sixteen track head block on, record a band, bass, drums, guitar, vocals listen to it and say now do the 24 track you know same tape same machine but just different heads line up and hear the difference and you it was huge it was it was quite a difference the 16 track was just it was definitely stunning. better wasn't it, it was yeah it was definitely, we, all, we definitely all went oh yeah it's really, <laughs> it's really, it's really different but I did that um, my morning jacket mm. on sit that's how I got the job because yeah. you know they, they the singer Jim James who's you know great singer and he said uh, computers, I never get, you know, computers don't like my voice. Mm. My voice always sounds terrible. I said, well, no problem, we'll do it on tape. I said, if you want it really good, do it 16 track. And he was like, oh, can you do that? I said, you bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> and I got did the whole record 16 track, mixed it to, you know, tape. There's no computer until it got to mastering, really. Brilliant. And it was fantastic. And 16 track, we only used 12 tracks most of the time. <laughs> And that's three tracks of drums. So you have stereo drums, which is a balance of your overheads, your toms, your hi hats, uh, your room mics, and your snare drum, all in a stereo, all on a stereo, two faders, and your bass drum on a separate track. Because there's no point in putting your snare drum on a separate track. Because why do you want to change it? Because as soon as you change it, you've got to change your overheads to balance it by the same amount. You know. Believe me, it's true. I've, the experience tells me that you got to just have the whole thing and get your balance right, and that's it. And you, you always want to—you never quite know where your bass drum is. You always want to fiddle with that, which sort of is separate. But you don't really want to fiddle with your 
snare drum and you end up whatever you do to the snare you have to do to everything else as well your stereo balance so you get three tracks of drums one track of bass which again is a mix of amp might have two or three mics on the amp amp and di all on one track so there's only four tracks here two guitars five six stereo piano seven eight lead vocal nine tambourine ten backing vocals eleven twelve there's the band <laughs> <laughs> and you end up putting simpty code on track 16 <laughs> <laughs> and every track on that record's like that brilliant and it sounds better for it, doesn't it? Though? Fantastic, yeah. yeah. And it's, we, I remember no, we were doing that with the drums on. I remember we were riding faders as we were printing things when he had like a cowbell in the middle eight or something. Yeah. Them, and we were like, turn that mic up for the middle eight and turn it back down because it was going on a track with the overheads. Yeah. And it always just sounds loads better, doesn't it? Just, and once it's done, it's done. You've yeah. forgotten about it. It's not something where you have to make a note of in the mix. I'll write yeah. this down in the mix. We've got to do that. I'm but you know, I, I do a lot of mixing and a lot of foreign projects and or people sending me stuff that I've never not met. And the amount of multi tracks you open is 125 tracks. <laughs> and like, every guitar's mic'd with three mics oh, and seven tracks and a DI, so you've got four tracks or something. Oh, yeah. And then you've got, um, if they put one extra little guitar note on, they've done it on another four separate tracks, even though they could have fitted it on the same tracks, yeah. but they haven't. <laughs> so you spend, you know, I had one the other day, there's 125 hours. tracks when I opened a session, and some of those were stereo tracks. And I spent five hours sorting it all out. And working out what was to be used and what wasn't, and bouncing down guitars to be one track for each mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. And then I did the mix in about an hour and a half, you know. Mm. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. But, but I, got no, it's to, I got it down to 32 from 125, I got it down to 32 and then mixed it. <laughs> but it's a lot to do with recording with external mic pre's, you know, mm -hmm. instead of having a desk with faders yeah. where you might have four mics on the guitar, but you mix it all down to That's one track. That's why I've got my exciting. API 3124 MB Plus, which is a mix bus on it. Yeah, yeah, a mix bus. So I can mix me four mics together. That's what you want. Or I'll record them. And just record it on one track. Yeah. And it's done. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. That's what you want to do. That's what, that's what I got it. But, you know, a lot of lot of people, I go in the studio with some engineers and they've got, you know, they've got the knee, they got one mic on the knees yeah. and the other one's on the focus, right? And oh, I think I'll try the API on this. And I'm like, what the, how do you know? Oh, I've done it before. You know, and then you... You end up with about five tracks for one guitar, and let's double track it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't work like that. You can't. You and can't find anything. You go up and down the screen all the time. Yeah. Mm. Moan, moan, moan. <laughs> I, I was going to ask one question. I was going to ask: Are you bored of talking about the past? <laughs> yes.